Hi, and welcome to our Instagram Live about becoming a writer. I'm Jenny Johnson, co-founder of My First Five Years. And I'm Alastair Bryce Clegg, the other co-founder of My First Five Years. And we know that the topic of writing is a really hot topic for parents. And what we're looking to do today is take a, a deep dive into all the elements that will make your child a successful writer, but really unpick it so that parents value the journey. Because I think of all the things, writing is one of those things that parents are really keen to get to as quickly as possible. And I think we're here today to try and persuade you otherwise. Because writing really is a journey and it can take some children longer to complete that journey than others and that's okay. And I think what we try to do in my first five years app is to help you as parents see that we are looking at the unique journey of each child and try, try really hard not to do that thing that we all do, which is to think, oh, that child's doing that and that child's doing that, but my child isn't. So what we're gonna do is touch on some of the things we feature in the app, which will just give you a bit of kind of inside information around how children develop as writers, so that you can look at some of the things your child is doing or introduce them to some activities or ideas that will really help them on that journey and be confident that what you're doing and what you're seeing is part of the journey and not feel like you have to push towards mm. that end goal. So maybe we can start with where that journey starts and what the elements are that make up an accomplished writer in the end. Yeah, because this is something I didn't even understand. When I went to be a practitioner in early years, I wasn't even that sure about how writing came about. I just thought it came about from a lot of practice. And I think what I realised is that how you feel about being a writer is more powerful than actual being able to write itself. So we want children to go all the way through this writing journey feeling enthused, inspired and curious about writing. We can broadly split the writing journey into three different parts. So you've got what you write. Now what you write, because writing for all of us, is really just talk that comes out of the end of your pencil. And talk is just thought that comes out of your mouth. So when you're writing, it skips the mouth bit and the thought comes out of the end of your pencil. So we need to have children who've got lots to talk about, think about, creativity, a wide vocabulary of possible, lots of experience of things like stories, books, rhymes, real life experience, so that when you come to write, you've got something to write about. And then there is the ability to actually hold the pencil and write. So physical development is the other big strand. And a lot of early writing doesn't happen with a pencil in your hand. A lot of early writing happens like on the climbing frame or outside running about, you know, batting with a bat and a ball or do whatever you do in the outside. We'll sort of look at that. Yeah, the, sorry, go on. The third strand is the phonics or being coming phonologically aware. So the idea that children realise that letters carry sounds and that words carry meaning and that tends to come later on in their journey but there's lots you can do to prepare children for that phonological awareness. Yeah I think there is um, parents put a lot of pressure on themselves to get children writing but actually I think we've got a blog about the fact that hanging upside down in the park on the monkey bars is just as big a part of learning um, to write as actually holding a pencil. It absolutely is and you want children to develop their kind of physicality, frame, core, upper body, because all of that needs to be really strong and in place to enable this little triangular movement that they're eventually gonna do, hopefully, when they hold a pencil and try and make those tiny, teeny letters. Because when you think about those early children that are really gross motor in their movement and they tend to kind of use their whole body and they fill a space, if we're trying to get them to then use this tiny little point of a pencil and make tiny little movements, that's a massive feat to ask them to do. So we need to make sure that their core's well developed, their upper body is strong, we know that when children develop physically, especially around things like mark making, they tend to start off with what we call a palmar supinate grasp, so that one, when they kind of grip their mark making implement in their fist, and they tend also to what they call pivot from their shoulder, so the movement comes from their shoulder. The legs tend to be wide apart for their, because of their centre of gravity, their cores engage, and they make these big movements. So again, it's really important that we give them space to do that if we can recognise that's how our children are moving. And once we consolidate that kind of upper body shoulder movement, the pivot then tends to move to the elbow. And there are two sorts of elbow pivot. 
There's the one where the elbow just bends and the shoulder still does a lot of the work, so like that. And then there's a more advanced elbow pivot where the forearm comes into play and all the muscles and tendons that are in there. And they allow the forearm to move independently of the shoulder. So you get a much more sophisticated range of movement. And then once children are really good at that, then they tend to move to be wrist pivoters. And usually at this point, their legs come in, everything gets a bit smaller and they start to pivot from the wrist. And that's a sign that the pivot is going to change again and move into the hand. And this is where the pencil grip starts to happen. So sometimes they'll go from palmar supinate grasp to a thing called a digital pronate. Now, as parents, it doesn't matter if you don't remember what they're called. It's just about recognising it. But a digital pronate is where they bend their wrist at almost 90 degrees and then they use their finger, which has been released from the palmar supinate grasp, bend their wrist and they just wiggle backwards and forwards on that finger to make smaller marks. Doesn't tend to last very long and not all children go through all stages because they're all on a unique journey. Often they move from palmar supinate grasp to what's called an expanded tripod where they just push out their mark making implement with their four fingers in the front and clamp their thumb in at the back and they wiggle backwards and forwards. Sometimes they do something called an inverted tripod grip. Who knew? Where they put two fingers behind, two fingers in front, their thumb at the top, and they wiggle backwards and forwards on their two fingers. And then eventually we want them, ideally, to work to that triangulated grip where they've got a thumb and a forefinger and a third finger tucked behind. Now, the only reason we want to do that is because that offers the biggest range of movement, which helps the fluidity of writing. But not all children will get there, but most will with the right support. And I think as well, there's no rush to get them to the end grip. So I very much was backing off with my third child and letting her write in whatever way was most comfortable for her at the time. And I sort of consoled myself with the thought that it's very, very rare to see an adult that still writes like this. So that confidence that nearly all children will go through these different phases and end up with a fairly traditional way of holding their pen or pencil. And usually when your child is transitioning into some of these finer grips, they will be probably at school or at nursery and they'll be working with an adult who's really support them with that. The only thing that we don't want children to do is to get really comfortable doing a volume of writing with a grip that doesn't encourage that mass fluidity. So sometimes they need a little bit of help there. But again, it's all done in a very positive and proactive way. This is not necessarily about strapping children's fingers to pens, which again, I've heard of in many years ago, uh, where you, you would have an elastic band around your wrist and against your pencil to make you hold it that way. There are lots of things that you can do. But for you as parents, when you're watching that development of your child, it's about thinking, right, what can I see? What parts of their bodies are they using when they come to write? How are they holding their mark making implement, whatever that may be, paint, brush, piece of chalk? And then what can I give them that really supports that movement, whether it's space or size or chunkier mark making things or smaller mark making things and help them to kind of transition from that big gross motor movement to that much finer movement. And I think you were just talking there about giving them the appropriate space to make those marks. First of all, what is mark making just before we move on? Good point. So mark making is literally making a mark, any mark. So it can be with a stick in the mud outside. It can be with felt tips on a piece of paper. It can be with shaving foam in, on the side of the bath when you're having a bath and making marks in that. It can be condensation on a window anything that makes a mark and it's really empowering for children which is why they love doing it because children don't often have lots of opportunities to make decisions in their lives a lot of children's lives are mapped out by us well-meaning adults <laughs> but when you discover you have the power to make a permanent mark or not even a permanent mark just to create a mark it's really empowering for children which is why a lot of them will do it and some of you will find as we have done in Virginia with my your three boys Lipstick on the skirting board, a black marker on the downstairs hall wallpaper, because it's that ability to create and make something that stays and is a, a mark of I exist, this is what I am, I did that. So we've covered mark making, which is a, because we use that term a lot and I think sometimes parents don't necessarily understand how that term fits into to writing. But the other thing is the appropriate space to make those marks. So you talked earlier there about how children can often be using very big 
movements to, to make marks. So when they're in that phase, there's very little point giving them a little notepad to write in or a little A4 piece of paper because they're just going to be going off the sides of it. It's not giving them the physicality and the space that they need at in, that stage. Yeah, in an ideal scenario, and I don't want to talk about ideals, you want a big space all the way through the mark making journey and a range of resources to, to mark make with and on. So if I need a big space because my physical development requires it, that's great. But then I don't want to reduce that space just because my physical development gets better. Because when I'm five and might be way more accomplished in terms of my physical development and mark making, I could still might enjoy working in a really big space to be creative. So the bigger space you can, the better. So things like kitchen tables or the floor or a wall. I mean, sometimes you can get cork squares that you can stick to a wall that you can put uh, pieces of work on or pieces of paper on. Or outside, you can buy marine ply. It needs to be marine if it's going outside and mm. you can screw that into a wall or onto a fence for children to mark make on. You can blackboard paint that. So you've got a blackboard and an easel. So things that double up. But also, you want children to have the opportunity to mark both, to mark make both vertically and horizontally. Because when you're working horizontally, you tend to bend forward and lean over your work. And when you work vertically, you tend to stand up straight and engage your core more. And the other big tip I would say is in a mark making space, I know it's dead tempting to buy the small table with the chair for children to do small mark making on. But if they can, stand up and mark make in a big space and um, that really benefits a lot of their development and if they don't have a chair to sit on that can really help I mean, i'm not saying you have to always make your child stand up to mark make paint and draw but when you sit down the chair actually takes away over 90 percent of potential development so you don't have to use balance or proprioception it limits your hand-eye coordination you don't do any foot eye coordination but when you stand up and there is no chair suddenly you're managing your upper body your core your lower body your feet your arms your eyes your ears so if they can stand up to mark make especially in the early stages it can be really beneficial i think as well some of the tools that children might mark make with the things that you might find around the home so things like paint brushes roller brushes and um, things that you use um in the kitchen cupboard there's lots of different Pine things scrubs, yeah all, all, sorts of things. all that good stuff so just think outside the the box a little bit about what you've got in the house because we we like to think that the majority of these ideas that we have you can do either with resources you've got in the home or resources that are outside your front door so just think about you know getting outside to do the mark making mark making with water is brilliant i love that one because it means that when the sun comes out it tidies itself up and there's nothing left to see so um, that was a favorite of mine. Rainy day mark making or rainy day development, physical development, if you've got a stiff brush or if you've got an, an adult stiff brush that you just cut down a little bit and have something like washing up liquid, cheap shampoo, bath oil, soap uh, flakes and you go out when it's really tipping down or with a hose pipe and get the children to brush and you sprinkle down whatever bubbly stuff you've got, the more they brush, the more it bubbles. It's quite giddy excitement. I mean, adults quite enjoy it, but also it's working their upper body, it's working their pivot, their grip, their balance, their proprioception. So when we talk about handwriting practice or writing practice when children are two, three, four years old, that's writing practice, because what it's doing is preparing them with all of the kind of foundations that they need in the physical development to become a writer. And actually they love it because it's engaging and it's fun. What it isn't is sitting at a table with a handwriting book. So we've covered physicality as one strand and we've covered talk as another. So maybe we can move on to this word that I love to say, it just feels really nice in your mouth as you say, but phonological development. So when you become phonologically aware as a child, it's when you begin to understand that letters are attached to sounds and that words carry meaning and that you can join letters together and you can take them apart and they can make different sounds depending on which combinations of letters you use. And of course, there are loads of rules that don't agree with each other in the English language. So it can be quite a complex thing for children to get their head around, which is why you get what's called phonetically plausible writing, which means that children will attempt to write words listening to the sounds that they know 
and so they're not correctly spelt, but they sound right if you sound them out. And you also get children who are in the very early stages of beginning to write where they'll just record the initial sound and nothing else because that's all they hear. So children go through a process of becoming phonologically aware. And part of that is their ability to hear sounds within words. So often children will hear the first sound first, but they wouldn't be able to tell you the sounds they can hear in the rest of the word. Then they tend to hear the end sounds because it's the sound that ends the word. And the thing that usually comes last is their ability to hear middle sounds because they're complicated because they're sandwiched in between the beginning and the end. So your child will go through that whole process of representing words in very different ways. But being phonologically aware doesn't start with letters. Being phonologically aware, I'm just seeing how many times I can say it in one sentence, <laughs> starts with their ability to listen and hear. So environmental sounds is the very beginning of that. And by environment, we just mean sounds they hear outside of themselves. So can you hear the clock ticking? Can you hear the fridge buzzing? Can you hear the washing machine turning? Can you hear can my you chest just yeah, mine. Uh, When you're outside, can you hear birds? Can you hear the aeroplane? Do we stop? Do we listen? And also that's really important in terms of what we often talk about in my first five years, this idea of serve and return, where the child will initiate some kind of interaction and the adult responds. And sometimes that's done non-verbally, but around phonic development, it can be done verbally. So the idea that they're able to hear and listen and pause, also we know that children who have a lot of singing in their life tend to make faster progress when it comes to being phonologically aware, because there's something about the way that the brain processes sound, the musicality, the pitch, the tone, and the more practice children get at singing, then the more their ear becomes attuned to listening and the better they become in terms of their phonological awareness. So really lovely singing, whatever it may be. I mean, traditional nursery rhymes are great, but sing whatever your children enjoy. That is preparation for this kind of phonological journey. So again, one thing I noticed when I worked in the nursery, well, there's a number of things. One, the amazing array of different ways children would hold the pens yeah. and the pen pencils. Some really convoluted ways of holding, but they typically progress through those. But also just how interested they tended to be about themselves and letters and sounds that were linked to them. And often they'd show an, a first interest in the leading letter sound of their name. Yeah. So, you know, my little Olivia, for example, it was all about oh, it was all about the oh. It is, and that is another, is another really common thing and that your child will become really engaged because they'll see it on peg labels, any personalised item they've got on maybe on their bedroom door, you've got a sign. So they get very, very familiar. But also you'll you'll have you know genius readers with children where you'll be driving past Tesco and your child will say, that says Tesco, and you'll think, oh my goodness, my child can read and they're only two. But it is the beginning of reading, it's the beginning of phonological awareness. They can't tell you that Tesco starts with a t t sound. They just know that that symbol says Tesco or Aldi or McDonald's or wherever it may be. But that's the beginnings of them being able to understand that language carries meaning. Another really powerful way to support your children with that is to read to them if, you, if you've got access to that kind of resource. But when you are reading, obviously sometimes you will just read for pleasure. Sometimes you'll point to the words as you're reading and they get to know that the picture means one thing and the words mean another. And of course, when it comes to reading, which is a whole separate live that we'll do, reading pictures is as powerful as reading words. And it's certainly an initial stage. So all the language you can do around reading a picture and your child is able to read a picture, even if they don't match the words, that's OK, because they're showing you they understand that the words carry meaning, even if they can't read them. So they will point at words and make up their own story, which is nothing to do with the words. In which case we're going to say that's brilliant what an amazing story it doesn't matter that you're not actually reading the real words you are showing me you are on that journey so i've got a funny story about um, writing and, and certainly a lesson learned i have three children and with my first child and i think these are common things that you do with your first children you worry more um we were at an open day for a school that i wanted her to get into and um, she was sat down at the table and she was playing with the various games that they'd set out for the children. And this little boy came and sat next to her and he grabbed a pencil and a piece of paper and he wrote his first name and his second name okay. beautifully. 
And I was watching this thinking, oh my God, if that's the standard the children need to be at to get into the school, there's no chance because my daughter couldn't even write her first initial, never mind her name. So we left that open day in a slight sense of anxiety that she wasn't where she should be. And um, I went to m and and they sold these books where the children could sort of copy um, formations and, and shapes and letters and, and literally like writing lines really and we sat at the kitchen table when we got home and we literally opened the book and said right come on get get on with it and um I look back on that now and I really cringe because a I went on a journey myself as a parent where I started to understand more and, and you were involved in in the nursery and you were really helping us value play so third time round that would not have been an approach but the sort of um, punchline to the story was that when she did start at the school we found out that that little boy that I just made a total assumption was the same age as Jessica was actually in the year above and 18 months older so absolute rookie error and poor Jessica was subjected to that really sort of old school way of learning to write whereas with Olivia my third who came along sort of 14 years later we really valued all the little elements that took her to becoming a really accomplished writer but there was no rush to get there at all and we had more fun as parents and she definitely think, had more yeah, fun as a writer that's the key because it comes from a good place you want the best for your children yeah. and i think what we can do though is quite successfully turn children off, off the writing stuff. process yeah. by trying to really give them the best so um, you know, one of the things we wanted in my first five years ethos and certainly the app to be was the idea that it would hold parents' hands through all of those stages of becoming. So reading, writing, mathematician, talking, and helping you to recognise that the little things that you see are really important and linked to the process. And therefore you can exhale a little bit and think, right, well, I can see they're making progress, so therefore I don't have to worry too much about the end goal because we're getting there and we can have loads of fun on our journey to reach that point. Yeah, so taking letter formation as an example. So I did it old school and poor Jessica was subjected to sitting at the kitchen table for 10 and 20 minutes at a time. Honestly, it was a time for tears and tantrums. She was so unhappy learning to write her name. I think when she finally got there, she and I were very relieved, but it just <laughs> was not the way to go. What's a better way? What's a more fun way? Just using that one little example of replacing the idea of the, the worksheets where they copy in patterns and letters. What's another way to learn letter formation? So first thing I would say is, is writing your child's name important to your child? Because if it's not... Yeah, not important yeah, to mum and dad yeah, or the school, but to the yeah, child. Because for lots of children, it isn't. For some it is, and they're desperate to write their own name, especially I find with older siblings, if they are writing their names. But for some children, they don't care. And also, it's not purpose for because when I am two and three and four years old I'm not signing checks every day so I don't need to write my name it's Does not anyone part. sign a check no, anymore? True <laughs> and no one signs a check only me back in the 80s so it's not part of your everyday existence so is it important who's it important to because I guarantee you if your child goes to school not being able to write their name that is okay because your school or setting that they go to nursery will be meeting your child where they are or should be and therefore it's okay if that's where they are especially if they've done loads of physical development loads of mark making loads of creativity loads of talk yep. that will come if they're showing which lots of children do a mad interest in being able to write their name then what we want to do is make it a really positive experience so what i try and avoid doing is the correcting in the moment yep. but by the same token you don't want to let them reinforce some really bad habits because unteaching a learned habit in terms of letter formation takes about three times longer and you've got to be really careful around saying you know that time you wrote your name and we all said oh they've written their name that's amazing well we're now saying it wasn't that amazing really so actually can we go back and do it properly and we use words like properly or you know that kind of stuff and they're all negative words around what we want to be a celebration so usually what i find to be really successful is that you look at where the child is at. So kind of the mantra of my first five years. So I might have a child who's gross motor, pivoting from the shoulder and the elbow, palm of supinate grasp, but is writing the initial letter of their own name. So what you don't want to say is, hang on, can you wait till you triangulate and then we'll come back to that again? You want to say, brilliant. The essence of handwriting, whether you're sitting at a table, doing it in a book or not, 
is that you are giving children a mantra for how you form a letter. Where do I start? Where do I go? Where do I finish? And therefore, it's all done through talk and language. You don't want your helping children to learn how to write, show them a picture and say, that's how you do it, get on with it. You'd always say, right, you start here, all the way around, big and fat, all the way around, up and down. And you make it fun and you've got your know, life and your voice and it all becomes like, oh, this is how you do it. So for me, the work that I have done is to look at what children are interested in. So what motivates my children? For me, when I was working with my own boys uh, way back when, it was very much Star Wars. So we had loads of lightsabers in our house. So I just said to my boys, do you want to learn to write like a Jedi warrior? Because they were beginning to show some interest, especially my eldest, in recording the first letter of his own name. So we did, get your lightsabers out. We're going to do ah, 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 which is the first letter of his own name. We're going to start here with our lightsabers because this is how Jedis would write an ah, which is the first sound of your name. Start here with lightsaber. And of course, you've got to make an absolute fool of yourself, but you do that all the time as a parent anyway. And you go all the way up to the top and then do you take your lightsaber off? No, you don't. Come all the way back down to the bottom. Them, lightsabers off and across and so it was very much the mantra of start at the bottom all the way up all the way down off and across and of course he got that really quickly and was dead proud to say I'm a Jedi writer but then when he then was triangulating with a pencil he was just using the same mantra of all the way up all the way down off and across yep. even if he wasn't saying it said consciously he was subconsciously but his letter formation was always good and he learned to do that in a really positive way that he also thought was excellent fun. Absolutely. And whether it's um, a, a lightsaber or a wand or you're a wizard or whatever you might be, or it's a stick or you're just using your finger. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I had a really easy one because uh, my third was Olivia, so it was an O, oh, and we could just start at the top and just go all the way around like the sun. Yeah. And whatever yeah, sticks like into their head. And also yeah. you can buy on various uh, internet and auction sites Things called finger lights, which they are got a little elastic band underneath, and you strap them onto your finger. And I think the youth use them in clubs where they and they the come youth. in different they come in different <laughs> colours. And again, that they was really brilliant, yeah. they're brilliant for using your finger, lighten your finger, a bit like E.T. But on a wall in the well, not in the bath, but right, um, on the side of the bath, anywhere where they can use that, anything that gets you just making the motion and the movement that's really good fun, all good. Unless you have pets, because it drives them absolutely yes, insane. They <laughs> start scratching at them. Quite good fun. Yeah. It is quite good fun to be fair. Well, to tease your pets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not very nice to the pets. No, let's not do that. Okay, we've had a few questions coming okay. beforehand, and a few questions um, coming as we've been chatting. So um, I'm going to link two of them together if you right. don't mind. So oh. one of them is um, when to intervene. We've kind of touched on that, but again, I just want to really reinforce that message about confidence. So, you know, correcting, intervening, and, and when to do that. And it links into this other question here, which is, my child does letters back to front, how can I help them? And the example that they're struggling with is a B and a D. Okay, so on the intervening bit and the correcting bit is the bit of sagely advice that I would give is, if you can avoid it, don't correct in the moment, because the moment should be about celebration with anything the children do. And therefore, what you want to do as a parent is say, well, they've done that and that might be something we could work on if it's appropriate. So what I'll do is celebrate the moment. Well done. That looks brilliant. Whatever. And then come back to that, usually through play or an activity or an interaction that's really positive and say it was around letter formation that we might not say, well, we haven't formed that letter correctly or that stick is, it should be attached to that. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, well, when we're going to come back to this another time and we're going to do some Jedi writing or Play-Doh modelling where we do a lovely long sausage of Play-Doh and we make your name in the dough or plasticine or whatever it is that we've got. So try and celebrate their achievement, but then correct or support or coach whatever's more appropriate at a later date. And in terms of things like the B and the D, that is so common. And again, for some of you, you will have children who do this magical thing called mirror writing, where they are able to go through a phase, it's usually later on, when they're quite competent in terms of their phonological awareness and their writing, but they reverse everything, so they write everything backwards, and it's like a magical skill. <laughs> and again, lots of parents worry that there's something wrong, or what do they need to do? It's very common, and children usually write themselves out of it. It's just because their brain is focused 
focusing on different aspects of writing and not just letter formation. But the B and the D thing is about how our brains as early writers and decoders are looking at a series of shapes, lots of which in our kind of English alphabet are a stick and a circle. Mm -hmm. So P, Q, B, D, A, C, E, they're all quite similar. Mm -hmm. So your brain has got to flip them, rotate them, transfer them, and B and D are the easiest to confuse. So usually B and D is self-correcting. And it might take a little while, but again, with practice and familiarity, children do. And again, as Jenny was saying about the grip, you get very few adults that reverse their Bs and Ds in their writing. And sometimes if you make it into an issue and give them a little, this is what you're being, this is what your D is, that can make it worse because it raises their anxiety. You can try using little rhymes and there are loads out there about which one's B and which one's D, but I wouldn't stress too much over it. It's a very minor point that will usually self-correct. Yeah, I think having that confidence to just let your children be a little and I think for me third time round and, and being much more grounded in, in the early years and respecting where she was in her journey with Olivia she would write streams and streams and streams of things that she could decode back to us you yeah. know they were phonically plausible if you could figure it out yeah. but there was very rarely the correct spacing there was definitely no full stops or grammars to begin with there was no capital letters it was almost a, a stream of consciousness but because we let her do that instead of constantly dipping in and saying oh that's a new sentence where's your full stop where's your capitals that's spelt wrong none of that mattered at that stage and now you know she's in secondary school she she's actually really good at creative yeah. writing and I do think one of the reasons is because we used to give her blank sheets of paper she'd you know stream and pour her ideas and her consciousness out there onto the paper and later was when we started to introduce these other yeah. important ideas but it is about recognizing to celebrate where they're at meet them where they're at and and have that confidence of what comes next and i think it's literally the the mission we're on at my first five years is to really try and empower parents with knowledge so that they can more enjoy the journey celebrate the children's successes and really begin to understand the journey that they're on yeah. so mindful of the time what would be your sort of final tip for parents helping their children become an accomplished writer so i know this is dead easy for me to say but the first one would try and be don't stress writing is an important milestone but it is a milestone at the end of a very long and very complicated journey that our youngest uh, children go on so it's about be well informed and again my first five years will really help you with that level of information to cling to that idea that how you feel about yourself as a writer, as a learner, is way more powerful than your ability to write or your knowledge of how to write. So if you can make it engaging, if you can make it so that it's purposeful, children are far more likely to join you on that journey. And make it as much about them as you possibly can. So things they're interested in, things they're engaged by, and link it to play. There's so much, and we've just touched on a little bit of it, but there's so much that you can do through play that feeds directly into these foundations of early writing that you don't need to hold a pencil in your hand and sit at a table to be a writer. You can really prepare your children for the writing journey through their everyday play and experience. And it is a topic we could literally spend hours and hours and hours on. So we've uh, done one of our uh, free guides. Um, it's available to download from the bio in our Instagram. So have a look at that and have a read of it at your leisure. Download our app. We can literally walk with you the entire journey. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the live. And thank you so much for joining us. See you again next time. Bye. Bye.